If you were able to be with us in Bible class, you already know that our speaker this hour is Brother Russ Earl, and uh, he presented a lesson in Bible class about the work that he recently did that we were able to uh, help support him with in the Marshall Islands as he went there and labored amongst the people and also taught in a uh, school of biblical studies or Bible college there. Uh, many of you already know Russ. We supported him and uh, his wife a bit while they were in the Bible Institute of Missouri graduating in 2008. Uh, he also, uh, many of you know him because uh, his father-in-law is Chuck Northrup, and I'm not sure whether he likes that known or not, but it's out of the bag now. But anyway, uh, uh, Chuck and Jody labored in the area for many years, and their daughter Lisa uh, is the one who married this fellow. And so we're glad that that happened and uh, glad for the work that Russ does. Russ uh, labors with a church in Ulaga, Oklahoma, and also is uh, one of the instructors on the Online Academy of Biblical Studies, teaching the Tuesday night classes. If you want to get on there, he's uh, done a series recently on Psalm 119, and I believe is about to begin one on the book of Proverbs. So uh, he is very active in his uh, teaching and preaching, does a very good job, and we're thankful that he's with us. Uh, he will have to leave just right after services, so you need to make quick work of visiting with him. Uh, he has to get back. Their services begin at 5 o'clock this evening, and I believe it's about a four-hour drive. And so he's, uh, he's going to determine how much time he has since he's preaching. But uh, also with him is a young man named Ryan, one of the young people from Ulaga, and uh, he's sitting over here with some of our young people. And if you'd like to greet him, it's always good to see young people who have the the dedication, the zeal to make such trips, and uh, we're thankful that he's able to be here with Russ today. But uh, if you uh, take the time to get to know Russ, uh, you'll appreciate him. And by the way, he is also going to be speaking on our lectureships this year in uh, September, and we're thankful always for the young blood that comes in, and we know he'll do an excellent job then. But we look forward to his lesson at this time. Good morning. It is good to be with you this morning. I am thankful for the chance to be with you. Uh, I have appreciated this congregation in many ways. Uh, as Brother Jack mentioned, the uh, congregation here supported me while in the Bible Institute of Missouri uh, from 2006 to 2008. I'm grateful for that uh, support during that crucial time of uh, learning and preparing uh, to be a gospel preacher. I also appreciate the support the congregation here has provided uh, for the recent trip to the Marshall Islands back in February. And if you were unable to be a part of the Bible class this morning, uh, we do have uh, a recorded version of my report on our church's website. This morning, our lesson comes from Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31, a section of scripture we know as the, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. When you think about that parable that the Lord gives us, it's one that when I read it and think about it, it's one that really brings a lot of emotions up, a lot of things to my mind to consider. This morning, I want to show how the rich man's position is the same position of so many people still today. This story of a rich man and a poor man is not one that is uncommon today. And just because the parable is given about a rich man and a poor man doesn't mean it can't be applied for those in, in other walks of life as well. It's not just one that applies to only the rich and to the poor. Today we will read of a situation that, we should, that should cause us to think about not just our own eternity, but the eternity that awaits others as well. We'll begin by looking in Luke chapter 16, verses 19, and verse, verse 19. When I've done this previously, that verse, those two verses there was, were my text. We notice there in Luke 16, verse 27 and 28, what the, what the uh, rich man says. He says, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, where I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And that's our main text for this morning. And we'll be returning to that here in just a few moments. But, of course, that is why our, our lesson today is titled, Lest They Also Come to This Place, because that is where we want to spend our time this morning is on that phrase. 
We'll begin, however, by looking at verse 19, where the Bible says, There was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. Now, since this man was rich, he wore purple and fine linen. Uh, that fine linen is believed to be made from, uh, some say, a yellowish uh, flax. Uh, for us today, it would be compared to a person who wears the best made designer clothing. If you ever watch much TV and watch some of these designer shows, you know we hear a lot of names thrown around of designers who most of us men probably have never even heard of before. But yet, that's what I think about when I read about the rich man. He had on the very best. When you think about that phrase, fared sumptuously every day, this rich man fared or lived in a splendid manner. He didn't have any needs or wants that were not met. You think about that type of a person who lives every day who has no cares. Money is really not an issue for that person. They can do and have and purchase whatever they would like. He lived this way every day. He lived a life of luxury. And that's the idea behind he fared sumptuously. He lived a life that he had no stress because of financial reasons at all. He had everything he required in a material sense. But let's also look at verse 20 and 21, the life of a certain beggar named Lazarus. The Bible says, And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate, that is, the gate of the rich man, full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell down from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Lazarus, very clearly, is a beggar. He was a man in physical need. He was, he was dependent upon others because of his condition, being a beggar, being covered in sores. Obviously, he had some type of physical ailment by him being laid at the rich man's gate. When I think about a person being laid at a rich man's gate, I see some, some homes. And we have to remember, of course, when I talk about the rich man, I want us to understand it's not a sin to be wealthy. The sin lies instead in the part where we rely on our materialistic possessions and not upon God. So let's be clear with that. But he was lying at this rich man's gate. And in some homes, they will ha we have some homes we have fences around them and have actual gates. Sometimes for those are for security reasons. But nonetheless, he's there at the rich man's gate. He's laying there in front his, of his gate. If you are a beggar, the gate of a rich man was, ide was an ideal place to be if he was, in fact, benevolent. If you're in need, the best place to be is around someone who's able to help you Someone who is, has the capabilities to do something for you. However, we must remember it also requires that person to be willing to do so. Christ makes the image of Lazarus worse by saying he was covered with sores and that the dogs licked him. That begins to show you the physical condition that Lazarus was in. He wasn't just simply a beggar because he was in financial need, but also he was in physical Problems. He had physical ailments, and that was one of the reasons, perhaps, he was there lying at the rich man's gate. And we think about that, obviously he was in such a condition there was very little he could do to help himself. Sometimes when we have those who come who need, who need help or ask for assistance, we do so, but also there are those who can really help themselves. But it appears here that Lazarus may not, may not have been one of those individuals. Being covered in sores, laid at a rich man's gate, lying himself to be licked by the dogs. Obviously, he had physical problems. The condition of being laid at the gate is the idea that he had nowhere else to go or no one to who, who he could go to who could help him. The picture of Lazarus is not a nice one. The Bible tells us in verse 21 that Lazarus was desiring to be fed by the rich man. It doesn't actually say that the rich man was kind enough to do this. You notice that there again in verse 21, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. The Bible says that he desired just to have the leftovers, whatever was left from his table. That's what he desired. But as I pointed out just a second ago, the Bible doesn't actually say the rich man helped Lazarus in any, any way, does it? The Bible does not, Christ does not say the rich man was benevolent. It doesn't say the rich man was kind. 
He doesn't say he fulfilled a rich man's desires and given him what was left over from his table. But Lazarus desired only the very least from the rich man. Let's look at verse 22. There are two different destinations for the two men. The first, we want to look at the rich man's destination. Again, he's not going to this destination because he is wealthy, but instead because of his disobedient life before God. You don't go to eternal damnation because you're wealthy. It's not a sin to be wealthy. It's a sin to place your uh, hopes and trust and your allegiance to materialistic things instead. But you look at Luke chapter 16, verse 22, the latter part of verse 22. He says, The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. The rich man doesn't have, as we'll see in a moment when we compare the two to Lazarus, the rich man didn't have an escort to his destination. As we'll see in a moment, the, the Lazarus was escorted to what? He was escorted by, the Bible says, angels took him to, to uh, Abraham's bosom. The rich man has no destination, or has no escort to his destination. The rich man's destination was Hades, a place of torments for those who have not obeyed God. Why does a person go to a place called hell? Is it because they are wealthy? Is it because they make mistakes? Well, that's part of the reason, is if they make mistakes. But why does a person go into hell? Why does a person go into torments? Because they are not obedient to God. So we think about why, what did the rich man do to go into torments? Christ doesn't have to say what he did, but by going into torments, obviously he was not an obedient person to God or to Christ. He was not pleasing the sight of God. The rich man's destination is a place of torments for those who have not obeyed God. Well, why was he there? Well, the rich man's sin had separated him from God. In Isaiah 59 and verse 2, the Bible says, But your iniquities have separated you between your God, you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. You think about this for a moment. How many times have you heard people say, Well, I feel like God is so far away from me. I feel like God has abandoned me. You know, there's a problem with that. First of all, that's not a true statement, is it? As a Christian, we know that God does not abandon those who are obedient. We see we find the feeling of God leaving us when we allow sin to separate us from God. What is it that causes God to separate himself from us? You get to notice it's not God who moves away, but it's us who are, who are separated from God because of our sins. It's like having two people side by side, and someone stands in between them, and he again shoves them apart. Well, that's what sin does. It separates you from God. He says there in verse 2, Your iniquities have separated you from your God. God does not leave the faithful, but the sin of the faithful, those who become unfaithful, is what causes us to be separated from God. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Obviously, sin is a huge problem. For the rich man, it was as well, because of his destination being a place known as torments. The rich man was in torments because of, not because of, his, because of his wealth, but because of his lack of love for God and his son. You look at Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 16. The Bible says, And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? He has so much that he has no room to store all the things he has, he has grown. All, he has sown so much, his barns will not hold everything. He said, this I will do, I'll pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Thou fool, this night thou soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall these things be which thou hast provided? You know, the story, the point there is not one that's hard to figure out, isn't it? We cannot take our possessions with us. We notice there in verse, in the very top of that screen, the first verse, he says, And I will say to my soul, 
So thou hast many goods, or much goods, laid up for many years. It sounds as if he's trying to convince himself that now he should be happy. That now he should be content because after all, he has so much. So, look at how much I have. But you know, we look out in the world, we see the same problem, don't we? Well, I have this nice house, I have all this money in the bank, but you know what? I need a bigger house. I need another car. I need to do, go on another fancy, expensive vacation. Those things themselves are not sinful, but when we put those desires to do those types of things before God, and then they are sinful. Because nothing comes before God. It doesn't matter what it is or who it is. When it comes before God, then friends, it becomes your God. It becomes your idol. We look there at Luke chapter 16, or excuse me, Luke chapter uh, 12, rather. He says, take, ease, take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Just be content. You have so much. But God said unto him, there's a problem, isn't there? You think about when you're in school, when you watch these shows sometimes on uh, different uh, networks about those who lived long ago. I think about the Egyptians. You remember their tombs, how they, when they open up their tombs, they have their, their, their corpse there, and they have also all these different things they put in their tomb with them. You know, they believe the reason they did that is because they thought they would take those things with them. We can learn a lesson from those types of people, can't we? You can be buried in your Hummer. You can be buried in whatever expensive car you want to, want to call it. But you know, when they dig you up, that car is still going to be there. There are no vehicles on the golden streets of heaven. There are no earthly mansions. No matter how big we make them here on earth, they're going to follow us into eternal life. So obviously, where do we need to spend our time? Not in the things that are materialistic, as we see the rich man obviously did, but in things that are pleasing the sight of God. Let's look next at the destination for Lazarus. Well, the latter part of verse 21, obviously I forgot that verse. So, he, so, so is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. The person who has not prepared himself for God for eternal life, doesn't matter how much wealth you have, you're not going to be pleasing the sight of God. Lazarus destination, Luke chapter 19, beginning part of verse 22. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Lazarus was carried to Abraham's bosom, also called paradise. When you think about paradise, what do you think about? You know, when I went to the islands, there were a lot of beautiful views, but that wasn't paradise. There were a lot, of, a lot of wonderful things you see and were able to experience, but it wasn't paradise. When you think of paradise in the eternal sense, what do we think about? For some of us, we realize that paradise means there's no more pain. There's no more aching joints, no more moaning when you try to stand up if you're sitting down. No more heart, no more medicine, no more mocking from others. No more temptations from the world. Paradise is a place that has none of those things. It's a place where God, Christ, and all the faithful dwell. In Luke chapter 19 and verse 25, concerning Lazarus, he says, But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. He was carried to this place of comfort because he had not disobeyed God. Now, the Bible doesn't say directly that one was obedient and the other disobedient. However, we know from other Bible teachings why a person goes to Hades and why a person goes to paradise. Obviously, one was obedient and obviously one was not. Now, Lazarus was in eternal life or eternal uh, heaven, the heavenly home because he, was, he had not disobeyed God. He had heeded the words of Christ or the words of God. Luke chapter 12 and verse 15 he, and he said, said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetous, for a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Luke 12, verse 15, what is Christ saying? All your possessions, that's not, not what life is all about. The person with the most toys does not win. The person who obeys God is a person who wins. A person who gains heaven as their home. That is what matters in our life today. 
He didn't, Lazarus didn't desire to be rich, but only desire to be fed. You go back to verse 21. He wanted to be fed from the, from the rich man's table. But let's look next at the rich man's final plea. And this is where I want us to really think about, really to focus upon. In Luke chapter 16, beginning in verse 23. And in hell, referring to the rich man, he lift up his eyes, and being in torments, he seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his, of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. The rich man was paying the price for his disobedience, wasn't he? You know, through the Bible says, he cried, he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Why? Because he was, the Bible says he was tormented in the flame. Do you remember how Christ describes the place of torments? He says three times in the gospel accounts alone, at least three times, it's a place where the worm, where the flame is not quenched and the worm dieth not. It's a place where there is no end. We think about the idea of eternal life. It is true we will all have eternal life. The question is, where will we spend ours? Will it be in a place of torments, a place like the flame that never is quenched, or in a place that's called paradise? We think about the rich man. He was pleading for relief from his condition. But we also know he found none. But Abraham said, Son, remember, thou, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise, Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. There was no leaving torments. There was no crossing over. Once you're there, you're there. After finding no relief for himself, we see next what the rich man does in verse 27. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house. Why would you ask for someone to go to your father's house? Well, look what he says. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come unto this place of torment. There is one thing that is clear about the rich man. He knew perfectly where he was. He knew there was no escape. He knew there was no relief. And he also wanted no company. He wanted no one to join him. Think about this for a second. How would you feel if you were in the rich man's position? Would you want anyone to join you? Who would you want to be spared the flame of torments. What would you want your own mother to be spared from torments? You know, this is who he's talking about. He's talking about his own family. He says, My brethren. He says, For I have five brothers. He's talking about his own family members. He didn't want them to join him there. Surely we don't want our mothers to join us there or our fathers to join us there. Surely we don't want our sons and daughters to join us there. Or how about our grandchildren and great-grandchildren? We don't want anyone to find themselves in a place known as torments, do we? What about our friends? We don't want them to go there either. That's what the rich man was saying. I don't want anyone to follow me. I don't want anyone to have the same destination that I have. When we think about the debt today, there's only one way that people today can avoid the same destination that the rich man has or had. We can only avoid that through obedience to the gospel. By following God's word, we can avoid torments. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if, if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. He's pleading for his brothers. He says, uh, They have Moses and the prophets, is what Abraham says. He, and he responds by saying, No, but if someone is sent to them from the dead, surely they'll repent. They need something to really shock them. You'd think the death of a loved one sometime would do that. 
Makes them realize, you know, I need to change my life and make myself right before God. Sometimes we allow ourselves to think that we're invincible, that we're going to live forever. Well, I'm only 55. I'm surely I've got a lot more years ahead of me. I'm only 14. Surely I have a lot of more years ahead of me. I was in junior high playing football. I got a phone call, my brother did actually, from the school stating a young man who was one year older than I was, he was 16, was killed in a car crash. He wasn't drinking. He wasn't doing drugs. From playing football, he had getting hit in the head so many times, he's having concussions, or he had concussions, he kept blacking out. Well, him and his little brother were driving someplace. He blacked out. He crossed the medium, he killed him, and it paralyzed his younger brother. He was only about 15 or 16 years old. We are not invincible. We will not live forever. We are not free from harm. And for that very reason, we better make sure that we are right in the sight of God. Because we don't want to find ourselves next to someone like the rich man, do we? In a place known as torments. But if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Sometimes we think, well, if I can just get my preacher to come with me, surely they'll, they'll listen to him. What if I can get my elder or one of our deacons to come with me? Surely they'll listen to my mother and my father who is faithful. You know, sometimes we can do our very best, and there are those who simply will not obey. And we look here, we see that's exactly the idea. And he said to, said to him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be just pers persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Who rose from the dead? Well, we know Christ was risen from the dead. We know he rose from the dead three days after his death on the cross, being buried in the tomb. It's interesting, he says, that they will not hear Moses, or hear not, they will not hear Moses and the prophets, and they will be persuaded by one who is risen from the dead. You begin to think, is he talking about himself? If they didn't listen to Moses and the prophets, they're going to listen to me. There are those today who doesn't, who doesn't matter how much teaching you do. How much uh, encouraging you do, there are those who simply will not obey the gospel. But we have to do our very best to do all we can to encourage people to obey because we don't want anyone to find themselves in a place known as torments. Abraham replies to the rich man and says, He has Moses and the prophets and that he should, they should listen to them. But yet, he says, they also will not listen if they want to listen to Moses and the prophets, then surely they won't listen to someone from the dead. What about you? What about your life today? Are you living a life that is in obedience to the Word of God? Are you living your life in such a way that when time has expired, you know where your destination will be? That it will be a place that's called heaven. Can we see similar problems today? Can you see similar problems in your own life? Can you see yourself as a rich man, or are you like Lazarus, who simply was obedient and found, him, found himself in the heavenly home and paradise? We know when we leave this life before the judgment, we'll go to a place called paradise. We'll receive heaven after the judgment. How do we today receive heaven or paradise, I should say, as our home. How can we reach that place? The rich man had those he didn't want to join him in torments. And today we have those who we do not want to go, who we do not want to see go to torments either. A couple of weeks ago, I was asked to do a graveside service for a man who I'd only met a few times. And his, his mother said, well, he wasn't really religious, you know, he liked to, he came to our food giveaway, he liked to listen to the class I taught, so he asked me to come and to do his graveside. And she handed me a poem, and she asked if I would read it. And after reading the first few lines, I handed it back to her and said, I can't read this. I cannot say about a man who you just told me, yourself, was never religious, never attended a congregation, wasn't a member of any church at all. How can I read a poem about him holding hands with God? Because it's not true, is it? Only way we can hold hands with God in a spiritual sense if we are obedient to the gospel. And he was not. 
when I taught that, when I did that funeral service, what I brought out was we had to be ready. He was only about 45 years old, had a sudden heart attack in the car while they were driving. If I remember correctly, he was dead before they even got to the hospital. Our life on this earth, as James says, is like a vapor. It appears for a little while, then it vanishes away. So the question we must ask is, are we prepared to leave this life? If you're something to happen today, because we are not guaranteed anything in this life, what would your destination be? Would it be a place of paradise? Or would it be a place with the flames, which a rich man described? This morning, as you think about those things, if you want to avoid the torments that the rich man described, we have to be obedient. After hearing the word of God, we must believe that Jesus Christ is, in fact, the Son of God. We must be willing to repent of our sins, to turn from those things and turn to God, confess that Christ is the Son of God, to not be ashamed of Him, to be immersed in baptism so our sins can be washed away, and that we can, at the same time, be added to the body of Christ. And then we must also remain faithful unto death. You know, that's what the Bible tells us from start to finish. Obey, 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 and receive eternal life. We know sometimes as Christians that we're not perfect people. We make mistakes, we say things, we do things, we may even think things that are not right for a Christian to be thinking or to be saying or be doing. But we have a chance today, we have a chance right now to make ourselves right before God. This morning, if you have any needs or concerns, you come forward. That's good. We stand and sing to encourage you.